All right, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Panel C of the Solcon Graduate Symposium, Embodied Practices of Survival and Self-Production. My name is Andre Williams, and we have four individuals presenting for you today. But before we get into that, I would like to remind all attendees that they are free to ask any questions regarding the presentation in the Q&A section whenever we're able, and we'll do our best to attend to them in the Q&A portion. Um, first off, we have Aliani C.H. Cooper, who is ironically our first presenter, presenting a small por uh, portion of their upcoming project titled These Violent Delights, Hunger's Monstrous Desire, and Marjorie Liu and Sana Ta Takeda's Monstrous. Aliani is a fourth year English PhD candidate at the University of Florida, specializing in comic and animation studies. Her research interests include monster theory, feminist critique, gender and sexuality, science fiction and fantasy, representations of blackness and speculative fiction, and anime and manga studies. Her dissertation project from which, which this presentation is excerpted is tentatively titled, We Live in a Time of Sexy Monsters, Desire and Monstrous in Contemporary Visual Media. When not dissertating, and, and I, eh, sorry, Ayani enjoys playing Destiny with her family, finding new cartoons to watch, and petting the neighborhood cats. Without further ado, Ayani, could you please turn on your microphone and camera? We can begin whenever you're ready and all set up. All right, excellent. Uh, thank you so, so much for that introduction. Uh, I am super excited to be here, uh, first as your moderator for last panel and now as a presenter uh, at SoulCon today and to be sharing a bit of my dissertation project with you all. Um, as a note, this is kind of a work in progress, so I'm really looking forward to any feedback that you guys can provide, including different scholars that I should be looking at, uh, different directions I can take, etc. cetera. Um, so as you heard on whole, my project centers around monstrous desire both the desire for the monstrous body uh, and how monsters are used to express different kinds of desire. So as we know, uh, monsters have historically been used to demarcate lines and boundaries that humanity must never cross, as well as to police and persecute behavior that exists outside of a society's socio-sexual framework. Since I can talk about monsters forever and only have 15 minutes today, I'll be focusing on the comic series Monstrous by Marjorie Wu and Sana Takeda. Uh, I'll be showcasing some of the ways that monstrous violence and cannibalistic hunger are used to challenge narrow scripts of femaleness and humanness. First, I'll highlight how monstrosity is constructed in the narrative. Next, we'll touch a bit on how and why depictions of violence and monstrous matter, as well as how cannibalism in text complicates and questions of who consumes and who is consumed. Moreover, I'll ground each of these ideas in close readings of specific panels or a series of images. So as a bit of a content warning, uh, I'll be showing depictions of clearly fictional but highly graphic violence, uh, as well as touching briefly on topics like violence against women and uh, enslavement. Also, though this may be obvious, I'll be spoiling some information uh, through the text uh, through chapter 24. Um, so, as a bit of context, Monstrous is an award-winning comic series published through Image Comics. The series can be categorized as a steampunk fantasy story, as it is, quote, set in an alternate matriarchal 1900, 1900s Asia. Takeda and Liu have filled the pages with dirigibles, scientific uh, potions, and magical machinery, while populating the land with a slew of fantasy peoples, including humans, shadowy old gods known as Monstrum, talking cats, animal-themed ancients, and the world's demi-humans in text known as Arcanics. However, this fantasy is liberally mixed with elements of horror, often reveling in the unsettling disquiet of psychological thrillers and the gore of slasher or splatter films. Lou is no stranger to hybrid genre narratives as she published a myriad of paranormal romance and urban fantasy novels before moving into comics. However, much of the horror's impact comes from Takeda's hauntingly beautiful artwork. She depicts wounds, amputations, and decapitation with such allure that the comic becomes simultaneously captivating and repellent. This is not overly surprising considering some of Takeda's artistic influences, which include Utagawa Kuniyoshi, 
the mangaka Mizuki Shiguru's yokai art and Ishihara Gojin, which you can kind of see samples of their art here. While Monstrous is gut-wrenchingly violent, uh, Takeda and Lu's work exists at the crossroads of the beautiful and the grotesque. Readers are confronted by horrific images, but are also invited to consider the exquisiteness with which they are rendered. So in this gorgeously brutal horror steampunk fantasy exists our protagonist, Micah Halfwolf, a young arcanic woman struggling to survive the trauma of war who shares a mysterious psychic link with a monster of tremendous power. Vulgar, violent, stubborn, and impulsive, Micah is a quote-unquote insurgent force who pushes forward doggedly to get what she desires. This drive, in part, comes from her need to survive the physical and mental connection she has with the old god, Zin. They are linked due to a bargain Zin made with one of Micah's ancestors, though the monstrum has been dormant for about hundreds of years or so before the beginning of the narrative. Combined, these two characters become the titular monstrous, uh, a force of abject terror and unknown power. And while they are fearsome, Lu and Takeda purposely set up audiences to align with their brutal monstrous, monster protagonist and in turn confront hackneyed ideas of the other. Though it's fairly obvious that a tentacle monster shooting from Micah's arm casts her as monstrous, it's important to gesture to how other diegetic and non-diegetic constructions of monstrosity structure audiences' understanding of character. For example, readers may view many of the characters in text as monsters already because they're imaginary creatures, a touch out of step with our reality. Conversely, from the very beginning, it's clear that the depicted societies in Monstrous erect barriers around the human, marking it as one of many disparate species. Micah, on page one of chapter one, is branded as an arcanic, uh, but with a fully human appearance, before readers even have a solid footing in the narrative. While it is ultimately shared that arcanics are hybrids of humans and ancients, the dialogue and full page image depicting Micah work to show that arcanics are different than or other than. By highlighting Micah's human appearance with the extra emphasis on fully, the off-panel speaker suggests to both diegetic and non-diegetic audiences that her looks are uncommon, or at least noteworthy. The three conjoined speech bubbles, which also note that Micah is 17, year old, 17 years old and a virgin, are placed above and to the right of her head, meaning they could theoretically be read before audiences even turn their full attention to Micah's exposed body, providing context for the deceivingly human young woman. Reading the dialogue together with the chained collar around Micah's neck and the writing prop held to her chin indicate that Micah is being sold as part of a slave auction, even if we interpret her expression as defiant, angry, or perturbed. Readers ultimately align with Micah as protagonist uh, and assumedly view the slave auction process as abhorrent and disquieting. Moreover, depicting her in this way shows how large the perceived in-text gap is between human and arcanic, while also playing on our historical knowledge that humans are very good at justifying their reasons for cruelty. Lu and Takeda double down on this perceived gap by having one of Micah's prospective buyers confirm her otherness. Are you sure she's an arcanic? We wouldn't want to buy a human by mistake. Even if she looks just like them, the humans of Monstrous have an investment in viewing Arcanics as not human in order to justify fear, racism, or even grinding up their bones to make their potions. One of the ways that Micah pushes back against this dehumanization is through acts of violence. In a 2016 interview with Vulture, Liu commented that, quote, Monstrous responds to violence committed against women by giving them agency in violent situations in a context that makes it impossible for the violence to be rooted in misogyny. Moreover, as I have argued elsewhere, Lu and Takeda use viciousness in the text to challenge ideas of acceptable femininity, Western hegemonic feminine ideals that exemplify socially accepted standards such as softness and gentleness. The series' aestheticization of violence is essential to their construction of female monstrosity as disruptive to homogenized femininity. What's more, this aestheticization becomes particularly clear in Monstrous's depictions of cannibalism. 
Historically speaking, Western, soci Western societies have created implicit connections between food consumption and women's bodies, from dieting and homemaking to the sexualized female body being used to sell food. For example, scholar Tisha Dijmani in her article, Food Porn as Post-Feminist Play, Digital Femininity and the Female Body on Food Blogs, analyzes the feminized space of the food blogosphere as a digital repository to contradictory discourses of hypersexuality, consumption, and the female body. While on one hand, uh, she acknowledges that these blogs are, quote, important sites of feminized media production that engage with digital constructions of the female body, she also argues that they can still perpetuate, quote, the fraught socialized relationship between women and food, in addition to harmful rhetoric around eating and body image. Controlling what's eaten, how hunger is handled or ignored, and the politics of consumption are always part of the conversation when considering women's relationship to eating desire. But what happens when this already troubled relationship, uh, what happens to this already troubled relationship when the bodies being consumed are literal? Cannibalism is, without a doubt, a fraught term in many ways and across many disciplines. Moreover, the accuracies of any accounts of cannibalism are, of course, dubious, but they are nevertheless powerful. As said by Rebecca Earle, quote, there is substantial literature on the ways Europeans used accusations of cannibalism to justify colonization and conquest. However, I'm using the term here to reference Micah and Zinn's consumption of humans and other organics. Old gods regain energy by feeding on said peoples, draining them of their life force and leaving behind dry husks. Although she fights against it, Micah's connection with Zinn makes her an accomplice to this cannibalistic behavior. Moreover, because of their connection, she suffers from her own hunger, as confirmed in chapter 23. She states, quote, I've starved. In the death camps of the Federation, I withered down to almost nothing. That agony near broke me, but this hunger, this is worse. Though there's a sequence that depicts the aftermath of Micah's hunger in chapter 23, I want to take a quick look at chapter 7 to show how Takeda's art impacts audiences' understanding of Micah's cannibalistic feasting. Similar to chapter 1, Micah occupies the entirety of this first page, but rather than being alone, she's flanked by sheep carcasses. While we learn that Micah is somewhat in control of the situation in chapter one, that is completely not the case here. The dull red blood splashed on Micah's face, uh, dribbling down her arm and landing on her clothes is a dramatic shift from the eerie green that dominates the panel. Her hair coils about her in ropes, similar to depictions of Zinn, as well as pulling on Mizuki's artistic legacy. You can see kind of two sample images there. Plus, we cannot see her eyes, denying readers the human connection of eye contact and setting us up for the dramatic reveal of the page turn. Though audiences are perhaps initially uneasy with the first image, this image here pur purposefully works to unsettle, with Micah's hair reaching out like tendrils. Uh, for another horror connection, uh, Junji Ito's Uzumaki, anybody? Uh, what's more, her irises and pupils are drawn solid black with heavy black around her outer eye. Her skin is colored a greenish hue and is covered with deliberate cross-hatching, almost as if the previous background is encroaching on her person. Her teeth are also purposefully drawn individually as she rips into whatever organ she's holding. We are supposed to be disturbed by these images. Cannibalism is one of the, quote, religious abominations or objections that are essential to the creation of monstrosity, according to Julia Kristeva and Barbara Creed. Marking someone as a cannibal makes them the consummate other, at least theoretically in part, because consuming the human body breaks the bounds between the self and other. Though she's eating sheep in this section, Lou and Takeda purposefully use this pre-cannibalism to build Micah into the consummate other. However, I argue this is not done uncritically. As stated by scholar Beverly, while colonial, uh, colonial discourse uh, generally employed cannibalism as a sign of ultimate difference, the figure of the cannibal in contemporary narratives most likely serves to deconstruct these differences. Today's literary monsters are most often returning the dominant gaze and calling into question their supposed otherness. 
For two panels, Micah looks back at the audience, inviting connection with the monster. And though Micah is repelled by her newfound hunger, Lou and Takeda use their cannibal heroine to disrupt discussions of acceptable consumption for women or the acceptable way women are consumed. We're repulsed by Micah's actions and we're attached to her. She is a monster and we accept her. Furthermore, Micah's cannibalism calls her world's hypocrisy to task. There's no self and other when you're being eaten. So my dis project sits with this kind of conversation more, uh, but also addresses how Micah as a woman of color and also as a disabled woman impacts the overall narrative. Uh, there was actually just a really interesting piece that I'm pulling on published in the new Rutledge Companion to Literature and Disability that touches on monstrous as well as my favorite thing is monsters, which is really interesting. Uh, plus, in this chapter, I get to talk about monstrous in conjunction with other works, including When I Arrived at the Castle by Emily Carroll uh, and selections from the Netflix series Love, Death and Robots. Um, so I'm going to stop here, but if you guys would like to hear more about my dissertation about this chapter, about Monstrous specifically, uh, feel free to ask about it in the Q&A. Thank you, Yanni. As a reminder, any questions should be directed to the Q&A section of the interface where we can get them at the Q&A portion of this panel. Love the presentation so much. And it looks like next up we have um, Peyton Christine De Christina Del Toro presenting her piece, The Body as Archive, Tattoos as Rebellious Reclamations of the Self. Peyton is a Chicano lesbian from the Metro Detroit, Michigan, and a PhD student in English at Ohio State University. Working with postcolonial critique and a Latinx feminism, she is interested in lesbianness in um, pop culture, motherhood, social media, and tattooing, but she has yet to choose a focus for her research. Peyton is a two-time recipient of the Donna Green Black Feminist Media Studies Award. Right now, Peyton is teaching a course about TikTok as contemporary knowledge production and distribution, and hopes to continue to bridge post-colonialism post with pop culture in their own work. Peyton, could you please turn on your microphone and camera whenever you're ready to go? You're free to go. Can you hear me? Are we good? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, lovely. All right, here we go. Can you see my screen too? Yes, I can, perfectly. Hey, hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it really means a lot, especially considering all of the circumstances and I'm sure you all could be doing a lot, other, a lot of other things. So thank you for being here. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting on the body as archive, tattoos as rebellious reclamations of the self. So you'll notice that um, this, this is actually a really new site of exploration for me. So. Um, like you'll probably notice that a lot of my thought process is actually like super self-reflective right now. So I'm super open to feedback. Um, you're hearing about your own story as maybe this will resonate with you. All of that. Okay. Oops. It won't let me. Okay. Fine. We'll scroll. Okay. So don't be sad. Go get a tattoo. Maybe you recognize that from TikTok. I'm obsessed with TikTok. Um, it's like a don't be sad. Go get a tattoo. But anyway, I'm going to start here with a little personal anecdote. The first tattoo I gave myself was an act of rebellion and healing. I woke up the day after ending my relationship with an abusive girlfriend and I felt calm. I hadn't realized how foreign the feeling of calm had become to my body. Everything felt still. Everything felt bright. I went down the stairs of my loft, grabbed a sewing needle and a bottle of ink that I had been saving and sat down at my kitchen table. An hour later, later I had a little black sun resting on my ankle. Well, it wasn't really a sun in the traditional sense. It was really a dot with some lines coming out of it. Um, but after, er, and after looking at it for a while, it honestly reminded me of the screen brightness symbol on my iPhone. But I looked at that little tattoo with pride. The pain of the needle sinking into my skin released the pain that I had been collecting within the span of my abusive relationship. The motion of the needle penetrating my skin was my own doing. It was my pain. After overthinking every single little thing that I did, said, ate, and wore during my relationship, it felt like relief to do something spontaneous that I hadn't previously been allowed to do. My ex wouldn't let me tattoo myself. So the little bottle of ink that I had excitedly bought specifically to put in my own skin 
sat in a box tucked away for quite a while. I nearly forgot it was there. But for some reason, I woke up in that still serenity that morning, and the first thing I thought of was that ink. I wanted it in my skin. During the span of my abusive relationship, my body was not mine, nor were my decisions. So that little black bone brightness symbol that became a permanent mark on my body reminded me of brighter days ahead. That moment of calmness surrounding that tattoo was written in ink onto the canvas of my body, unable to be forgotten for the rest of time. So Gabby Rivera, author of Juliet Takes a Breath, amazing book, by the way, highly recommend it, like my favorite ever. Um, she started a podcast this year called Joy Revolution. And her main question in the podcast is how do you prioritize and find joy? Um, so she interviewed tattoo artist Tamara Santibanez, who said that so many of the people who I tattoo are coming to me with some sort of desire to assert an ownership over or to reclaim their bodies. As many queer people of color do, I grew up struggling with my mixed race identity, suppressing my lesbian identity, starving my body, bleaching my hair against my will, and overall just desperate to find a home within my body. But it wasn't until I got my first tattoo that I began to create that home marked onto my skin. And it wasn't until I gave myself my first stick and poke tattoo that I understood the depths of my own traumas and how much power I had to rewrite them. When Tamara, described tattooing as liberation work within the archive of the body. I was inspired to look at the ways in which queer POC artists have depicted the power of tattoos. So in undergrad, I, oops, sorry. In undergrad, I came across this image by Esther Hernandez um, on the cover an, of an anthology called Chicana Lesbians, The Girls Our Mothers Warned Us About, edited by Carla Trujillo. Um, so the first thing, of course, that I noticed was La Virgen, and then, and she's obviously one of the archetypes and symbols of Chicana femininity, and then I noticed the flower, and then the hand holding the flower, and then the hand seems to disappear into the red behind the flower, and then I see it! La Virgen's hood is the labia menorah. It's tattooed onto her back, the flower is a vulva. I was fascinated with the idea of sexually sexualizing an image that holds so much shame for sexuality and putting it onto a body, especially in a way that doesn't seem to exploit either of the women's bodies. This woman has an alternative hairstyle and what looks like a sword for an earring and maybe even some blue eyeshadow. She's clearly gender non-conforming, but she's made up of symbols of Chicanx femininity yet none of that femininity is in ways patriarchy or machismo would like. As soon as I realized how incredible this piece was, I honestly wanted it tattooed on me. Not like just La Virgen, but I wanted the full portrait of this badass queer woman with that giant tattoo of a vulva on her back and the hand going into the flower, all of it. I wanted a tattoo of a woman with a tattoo like that. And then I learned that this um, issue of the book with this cover was pulled because it was too controversial. So they changed the cover image. Then it made sense to me why I wanted it tattooed. If it's on my skin, permanently etched into my body, no one can take it from me. No one can take it away, no matter how controver controversial it is. So similar, similar to vibrant makeup and alternative hair colors and styles, tattoos say something even when we, we must hold our tongues. They defy the nature of silence. They violate the rules patri patriarchy places onto our sexed bodies, and they ground us in community in ways oppressors cannot take from us. This next image is of Las Cholas in Love. <laughs> um, two things really stood out to me in regards to what the tattoos symbolize in this image, noted by the bullet points, alternative femi femininities and masculinities, and the queer nature of body modification. So for myself, especially in college, and even in my first year of grad school, I felt that my Latinidad was so intimately tied to my femininity. So like without falling into the tropes of stereotypes, I felt that my big gold hoops and brown lip liner with my bold red lip and winged eyeliner that basically, you know, reaches the goddesses above, um, all of that was what made me, or at least made me read as Latina. I got my first tattoo, which was actually a Gloria Anzaldúa quote, um, but when my Tejano grandpa found out, he gave me the silent treatment. 
he got out of, over it, of course. Um, but what it did signal to me is that with this ink on my arm, I was no longer fitting into the image of a nice Chicana. Simultaneously, I remember the whole first month I got it, despite the fact that, I was, that it was getting cold outside, I would push up my sleeve so that everyone could see it. I like strutted into my normal coffee shop, expecting everyone to notice my newfound rebelliousness. I especially saw it as a marker of my queerness. So if a cute girl was at the coffee shop, I'd put my hair up to show off my undercut at the time that I had at the time. And I positioned my arm all weird to make sure that she could see my tattoo and that it was on display. Um, so whether or not it was actually clear to anyone but me that this was my form of queer signaling, I fell in love with this idea of expressing myself without saying anything. I found it so relieving to have visible markers on my body that may express to another girl that I think she's cute without saying anything. But more so, I love this newfound personalization for my body that I could choose and feel extraordinary pride for. In the many ways growing up that I hated my body, this newfound love for it felt amazing. Body modification is queer by nature, and simultaneously, it allows queer folks to see themselves as well as be seen in the ways that they want. As you can see, I maybe got a little carried away because, with that feeling, I mean, because I ended up shaving my head and getting a lot more tattoos, um, both like my own stick and poke tattoos as well as professional ones. Um, but the downside is that while I found solace in this new visible queerness that I've taken on, I began to struggle with my identity as a Latina all over again, because now I'm not what a Latina is supposed to look like. Then I saw this image. So we're, we're getting back here. <laughs> then I saw this image, and I was particularly drawn to the figure on the left who appears to present more butch. She's got a mor tatted on her neck. She's got a badass tattoo sleeve and big gauges with her seemingly short hair. And she looks fucking cool and gay and Latina. And she's got all this masculinity and she's still got that beat face. Like you see the, her eyeliner wings and her nice brows. Um, yeah, love that. But um, she looks fucking cool. So this op image opened up a whole new world to me of being Latina and butch, being butch with makeup, being Latina and butch and also still desired, symbolized by the hand on her chest. She's all of these things, which gives me permission to be all of these things. Um, so what Ileana, the creator behind the brand Romija, exemplifies in her work here is how tattooing can be for oneself or for an assertion to others. Um, so on the left, we see an intimate affirmation tattooed on an intimate location of the body with the Miha, you are loved. That's like the term, like a really, I don't know, it, makes, it gets me all choked up. And then it's also like under her boob. So pretty intimate um, location. I mean, depending on the person, I guess. Um, so tattoos in discrete locations typically are meant to be self reminders or like memories that one wants to hold on to without like explaining it to every single person that they meet. Um, and on the right, we see a self marchola tat tattoo um, near her collarbone on proud display. So Afro-Latinas often deal with the invisibilization of either their blackness or their Latinidad. So this chola tattoo works here as a signifier, but also as like a self-claiming of her chola identity. So as queer POC, we move through the world constantly reminded of the ways these systems were not set up for us to, to survive and how little we are understood, let alone respected. So when I look down at my arm to see my encouragement from Corian Saldua to write and keep writing, or I look at Sorwana Inez de la Cruz and I remember how powerful it is to take control over our own understanding of our racialization or how we have always had to do the best with the systems we have access to, my ink is like a note to self. Tattooing is an act of self-love, self-identification, and validation. Our histories are recorded onto our bodies through tattoos, symbolizing moments as well as people, identities, or concepts that make us who we are and allow us to survive. So I know we all can read here, but I'm just gonna read this one. Um, so there is radical potential in the act of tattooing and being tattooed. In tattooing ourselves or be being tattooed by someone we trust, we assert ownership over our bodies and we allow ourselves to love our bodies. With the flesh as our canvas, we capture moments, images, people, and phrases that give us strength to survive. So now I wish that I could like cue a little like, don't be sad, go get a tattoo outro. <laughs> but that's it. Thank you guys.
Hey, thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Such beautiful artwork and such beautiful tattooing. All right, give me one moment while I just uh, check something real quick, just to make sure we're still on track. All right. So it does look like we have um, Cass Lynch pre presenting their piece, Mandating Critical Race Studies and Curriculum in K-12 and Higher Ed, and has actually opted to introduce themselves. Um, Cass, could you please turn on your microphone and camera? You can begin whenever you'd like. Okay, there we go. My headset has an extra uh, mic button, so if I hit it on accident, just let me know, please. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, my research is a little bit different than what everyone else has been sharing so far this morning. Um, I am so honored to be here. Thank you so much. So I am not currently in uh, in a program right now. I actually took a little bit of time off to, to have a child and raise my child. So that's what I'm doing right now. However, um, my research I, has been kind of like a, a brainchild of mine. And so my research is uh, directly tied to my identity. So I am an unenrolled Muscogee and Cherokee mixed race person, obviously, right? And um, for the past uh, several years, I have been working with local uh, Native American communities or American Indian communities. We got all sorts of terms, right, here in San Diego. And as I was working with them, I kind of fell onto this pathway of anti-racist education. And so my research involves both the, um, the study of the rhetoric and visual rhetoric of the recruitment of radical white supremacist organizations, um, but also kind of went into sort of course curriculum development. So what you're going to be witnessing today is sort of like my um, trying, to, trying to sort of kickstart this, this initiative here in California for, again, mandatory critical race theory education. Um, I don't have any fancy images or, or anything today, and, um, and so it's just going to be me speaking, and hopefully, hopefully that doesn't get too, too boring or anything for y'all. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to sort of cover critical race theory in general a little bit. So critical race theory, right, is, um, is, is not really just one theory. It's actually a unifying... Um, a unifying set of theories that kind of bridged together all sorts of different social justice theories, psych uh, psychological, philosophical, like you name it, right? But it was born out of legal studies in the mid-1970s, and it was started um, actually as a largely intersectional movement, slightly before Miss um, Crenshaw came up with that term, right? So her, her, um, her work, her framework for intersectionality was actually born out of critical race studies. She was one of the founding members of this movement. It's something that is not necessarily talked about a lot, even when you go through quote unquote like ethnic studies education, but it's definitely something that we need. So in the United States, you can go from K through 12 and you can go from whatever pathway in higher education you choose from beginning to end PhD, MD, whatever, right? Any of those programs without ever having to take a single course in critical race education, meaning any course that teaches you about race, racism, etc. Right. And so the idea of critical race studies being born out of, out of legal studies, right, got started because these scholars, Derek Bell, right, Dr. Derek Bell being the, um, the top scholar, like basically the guy who created this entire um, idea, this movement, right, um, he, uh, he looked at all of the legislation, all the curriculum, everything that, that existed in our legal system, um, up until about the 1960s in the so-called civil rights movement, right, which at that point was still questionable legally. Um, he looked at all of this and then he said, you know what, white supremacy is the foundation of our entire country. There's no getting around it. There's no reforming the system. We have to burn it down and start over. How do we do that? We start by at least trying to teach people why we need to burn it down to start over. 
So of course, <laughs> of course, this isn't exactly going to go over well with a lot of mainstream universities, everything like that, right? Luckily, he was already very well respected in his field because as a black man saying something like that within a largely white institution would not have gone over well, especially in the 1970s, right? Um, so, so yeah, exactly right. Like I'm seeing the chat right there. I, I totally agree. White supremacy is not made to confront itself. And that's actually one of the tenets of critical race theory, right? So critical race theory has some core tenets. Um, what, what all of these scholars decided is that, like, look, we have to figure out a way to teach people how to just like stop this, right? How to help us put an end to these systems, put an end to this entire system of white supremacy that, by the way, was only created a few hundred years ago, right? Um, and so, so critical race theory and studies-based education or curriculum really seeks to do a couple things. The first is you have to admit that not only is racism real, but it's also just an organic or quote unquote, right, normal science within Western society. So what we, what we mean by normal science is not that it is real in terms of biologic or phenotypic um, characteristics, but that it is real in the legal sense, meaning it was created to legally bind people to these identity constructions, which is actually the third tenet, but we'll get there, right? Right. So, so when you start your critical um, study, your critical race studies education, you have to accept that. You have to learn what racism is. You have to learn that, for example, you can't be racist against white people, which usually gets my students. Um, and you also have to learn that racism is a system and set of powers, not about people, individual people being mean, right? And so that's that's a huge core again that differentiates critical race studies education from just taking a quote unquote ethnic study course. Um, the, the, next, the next point is, is has a, different, uh, a couple different terms, but like there's interest convergence, right? Basically what this means is this, this means that white people will choose whiteness over everything every single time right? It means that, yes, we all do have intersecting identities, and yes, it is possible that working class people can unite with working class people. Um, disabled folks can unite with disabled folks. I, um, I am a person with multiple disabilities, so um, all these different things, but at the end of the day, if you are white, it doesn't matter. You will choose whiteness because whiteness means power and power means status quo, right? Um, and so again, not things that the average person, especially the average white person or person who identifies as white, is going to really want to accept an education, right? Um, the third one is the social construction theory. So social constructionism of race didn't actually exist until the 1970s. That idea that we kind of just take for granted now in academic research where we just immediately go like, oh yeah, gender is a social construct, race is a social construct, everything. That didn't really come about until, until Derek Bell came along, right? And, and so because of this, um, you have to, again, accept that race is a, a construction and not a real biological fact. Also not something that, um, that people uh, still today want to admit. And then finally, you have the racial, racialization of the other, right? So we have to admit that othered groups become racialized in some shape or form, and that race, because it is highly um, well flexible, et cetera, et cetera, for example, right, the Irish bought their whiteness. Um, you can, um, you have to, you have to understand how that fluidity functions and the fact that people will become racialized again because of power structures, etc. Um, there is like a newer tenant to racial, um, to, to uh, racial theory and everything, and or and one of those uh, I actually use in my curriculum, so it is important to note. It is still somewhat controversial, but as an indigenous scholar, it's something that's extremely important to um, from for us from our cultural standpoints, right? But what that is, is that something that's called the voice of color thesis. So the voice of color thesis states that basically if you are a person of color, um, even if you are light skinned, right? So I am obviously white passing light skinned, but even if you are um, a person of color or a descendant of whatever, right? You have an inherent knowledge that a person who is just white cannot possess. Therefore, you can potentially teach 
them things that they have no way of otherwise conceptualizing or understanding. Again, this one is really controversial because people don't like the idea, one, right, that, um, that they can't ever learn something no matter how much they study it. But then there's also this idea of like, well, it is problematic to suggest that just because you're born with a certain skin color or you're born being racialized, that you do like have some inherent knowledge or, or like ability to teach. It's not necessarily about that. And I definitely don't use it like that in, in my classroom, which I'll get to in a sec, but, but that's why it's controversial, right? So, so why, why am I talking like this is like all new and everything? Because it's not, right? It's not. And I'm definitely not the only person out there doing this work. Like Ibram Kendi is basically my god right now. I follow everything that man says. And Kimberly Crenshaw, like all of these people. Um, I recently just w was awarded <laughs> um, or granted the very first critical race theory course at San Diego State University. So in its over 100 and 10 or something year history, my university has never offered any type of course in this. We do have certain courses that are offered throughout different anthropology departments and such um, that deal with like race and all that, but it's usually only from an anthropological or a political perspective where they're examining historical case studies. So I was given the very first one. Unfortunately, this um, Unfortunately, this course is only being offered this semester to honors students, so it's, it's going interestingly. However, the curriculum that I've been using, I've actually developed in my freshman um, composition and my freshman American Indian Studies courses. So these intro level courses, right, I've been kind of using as, um, as a testing ground for this type of, uh, type of curriculum, just to prove that it can be implemented in any discipline at any level, et cetera, right? Um, now, in my course, one of the things before I get started that I always emphasize is the fact that I can only speak to my perspective and that any of us can only ever speak to our perspectives. So I always, always, always stress the fact, right, that um, you do have to take into account all of your biases. You have to accept your biases and your prejudices and you have to confront those. I also always let my students know that as a light-skinned person, I can never speak um, uh, on certain subjects when it comes to being discriminated against purely based on skin color, right? And so because of that, the, the curriculum that I propose um, differs from a lot of the curriculum in that I want more than one person in the classroom, right? So for me, this semester, what I've done is I've relied on a wonderful network of colleagues and friends that I have who have volunteered their time to come into my classroom or have like allowed me to pay them the very little money that my university granted me and I'm bringing them in to speak to my class so that it's not just me. I also use a lot of multimodal texts in my course right so that they always have access to all these things. Again this is different than what I'm about ready to tell you right which is what California just passed. So California just passed a AB 1460, which sounds wonderful because it made California the first state in the nation to make, uh, quote unquote, ethnic studies, right, a mandatory requirement for graduation in the CSU system. However, <laughs> the problem with this is, well, there's, there's a couple problems. The first problem is that ethnic studies in and of itself is a problem because it others us in the first place and it kind of makes it sound like we should always just be these like artsy classes or whatever that people take on the side. But another issue with this is um, it actually doesn't allow us, the instructors, right the instructors or even the schools to control the curriculum the curriculum will become standardized and come from the state government so if it's being written by the same white supremacists who write textbooks and all that kind of stuff it's not going to change and it doesn't even matter if we get any type of education and again another problem right with AB 1460 is that there's absolutely no requirement for you to even learn about white supremacy or race or racism so so when I have freshmen come into my class and I start talking to them about issues like, oh, this was genocide and oh, my people were killed this way and oh, this happened to natives and oh, they stole our land, right? Obviously, I'm not dismissing these issues. I'm just saying 
like this is what happens right my students will usually respond with well why didn't you just do this or they'll respond with some other myth or something they've been taught so it's like if we just keep perpetuating these same freaking stereotypes and rehashing these same narratives and relying on these same white supremacist scripts we're never going to be able to actually dismantle anything or um or move on, right? So the curriculum that I've been developing takes into account all of this critical race theory education, but then allows you to apply it to just about any subject matter that you want. So the framework that I'm working on that I hope to turn into my PhD um, the framework that I've been developing essentially gives you right just the the set of the concepts the tools whatever the lenses that your students need and then it tells you how to then apply it to any subject matter you want right so for example we can do a querying or a queer reading of a text right we, we know how to do that we can we can do that as grad students whatever as um, as instructors but our students have never been taught how to do that period yet right most of the time when they're coming to the university so they definitely don't know how to critically read a text when it comes to looking for racism right or looking for um, racialized language so when i show students examples of like the founding documents and stuff they can't look at it and say like okay when they say this word that means you know like um oh fair-minded they don't mean fair-minded they mean white right? My students have no idea how, how like fair-minded translates to white. And again, it has to do with that, that base level of education that we're giving them. So even when you start studying things like science, or you study, well, obviously, anthropology, right? Um, as an indigenous person, no offense to any anthros in the room. Um, but anytime you start studying any other field, right, you need this critical race foundation so that you can begin understanding why we say the scientific method is race right or the scientific method perpetuates white supremacy again if people hear this and they have no no critical race background they're immediately going to be like okay conspiracy theorists will just dismiss it but there are very valid right um frameworks and and everything and research backing this so um so again right like um I'm, I'm kind of like trying to catch up here with this with this chat. I, I, I apologize. I can see that like y'all are making amazing points. I've been so just like so blessed to be a part of all of this. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I cannot begin to agree enough about all of the injustices and everything that have been committed. Like I again when i when i try to teach this this stuff to my students usually what i what i hear is i hear them parroting their parents to me right so these students have, have like never been asked to think about these things on their own and even though our k-12 education um, systems are implementing what they call like critical thought or critical thinking whatever they're still not teaching students to go beyond whiteness, to go beyond white supremacy, to go beyond this idea that like there's only one correct answer, right? And so, so that's just kind of this whole, the whole driving force behind my, my curriculum is I went from researching the white supremacists and trying to figure out how to stop them and figure that out to just saying, you know what, whatever, let's just go the complete education route and just try and redesign this. Because again, you can't, you can't, um, you cannot decolonize a system that and an institution that was created to do exactly what it's doing. The university is doing exactly what it was designed to do, keeping you know everybody out that they don't want, et cetera. Um, but we have to try. We have to try. We can't obviously go make our own schools, so we gotta try. Um, and so I saw that there was a, a question here, and I don't know if the question counts as like part of our questions or if I should just move on. I apologize. Right now. Well, we can actually include that question in the Q&A section, which we are about to start for the moment since we um, are running into a few technical difficulties. We can actually proceed to the Q&A section right now while we get that resolved. Um, we can actually start with yours since uh, you're fresh off the subject. Um, would you like to answer that question that was placed in chat? If you were the Secretary of Education, would you suggest a student start this? Um. Okay, so so first of all, like it's a running joke right now that I'm gonna one day just run for EdSec. So we'll see, we'll see if it happens. Um, but 
where would I suggest the students start this? Yeah, this is elementary school. This is this is all the way back to kindergarten. This is back to preschool, right? If we look at black, um, black identity model formations or formation models, sorry, it's early in the morning for me. Um, black identity formation models, whew, and the indigenous models that we adapted from that, we're we're learning to formulate our racialized identities as early as when the television comes on and we can see it right so it's ridiculous to think that like just because white kids don't have to think about that kind of stuff until they're they're older we shouldn't right already be sort of introducing this to everybody um so really i would i would say that no no, no we got to start as far back as the moment children start coming into contact with one another because they're bringing in all of their parents baggage the polite way to refer to racism i guess Absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. Um, next que question is for Peyton. Uh, do you think someday tattoos will be literally animated on the body on regular skin movement? What, do you think that would add to, to looks ta uh, tattoos looks and um, potentially meaning? So like, um, as like how tattoos tell a story in their own just from an image, do you think like playing out scenes on a person's life will be actually possible one day? Um, person that is asking thinks of the Illustrated Man by Bradbury, where the stories came to life on the skin. Interesting. I mean, like, technologically, I have no idea. That's, like, wild. I love it. Um, I feel like that really prompts me to think about, like, like, when I think of what animation serves, or, like, what animation does, like, to me, it seems like that is even more so for an audience, or, like, for entertainment purposes. So I feel like that would definitely shift, like, what tattooing is and what like where you would choose to have one like obviously if i'm gonna have like a little story right here going at all times i'm gonna have to get really comfortable with strangers staring at me <laughs> for like prolongated amounts of time and i feel like that would be i don't know that just really changes like the the idea the really like because i think my presentation was focused on like intimacy of tattoos and i think that if tattoos were animated, that would be more, like, I, it feels, at least to me, like, that would be more for an audience, because, like, when I, when I, like, see my own tattoo that I was talking about, like, I can, I can see that image, but, like, what does someone else need to see that for, for, like, at least that, so then I feel like if I was going to get, like, I don't know, a tattoo about a different, Im like, I would, I would, I don't know, like, you know, it's just, ah, yeah, that's a really fun question, I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That is a interesting thing to think about, considering that the future advancements, because we just never know exactly um, what is possible when it comes to that. And now the next question I have for Ayani. Um, without being too revealing, how do you feel the artist treated the character Micah um, in terms of their existence of the character in her de dehumanizing state? Okay, so without being too revealing, um, thinking about the depiction of how she's dehumanized, so to speak? Um, essentially, like, how she's treated not only as a character, but in the universe around her, kind of like how that creates some parallels to um, a few situations, like how she's dehumanized despite looking in any, in all ways like a normal human being. She very much has these essential abilities and characteristics that just set her apart and are exactly what dehumanizer this this by everything being at face value the same. Oh, okay, okay, so forgive me if this is completely offbeat, but this is where my head is going right now. Uh, so one of the things I talk about a bit more uh, in the chapter is thinking about how Micah is potentially passing uh, in the narrative, right? That she is not visually coded as a arcanic in a lot of ways other characters are. Um, so she's allowed to, in some moments, use her human appearance in order to slip by undetected, let's say. Um, but that actually becomes a major point of contention for her in a lot of places in which uh, other characters will enact a strange kind of inverse one drop rule, where they'll say, oh, you're only part arcanic and that's not enough to really be with us and spend time with us. Um, so I think Lou is actually, and she's quoted as saying this on some interviews, is making some interesting uh, connections between what it means to kind of have 
a multitude of identities, um, especially when it's not necessarily easy to tell just by looking at somebody uh, what they have going on beneath the surface. Um, and I think if I'm remembering correctly, Marjorie Liu is also biracial. Uh, so she's kind of pulling some of her own experiences into her creation of Micah as a character. Um, but something that I'm also thinking about is that Micah is very deliberately coded as a woman of color in the text um, and how that impacts how we, how audiences both outside of the narrative read her as a monster, but also how our uh, characters inside the text read her as uh, a monster and monstrous. Um, so I think there are a lot of interesting questions that are kind of swirling around identity, identity formation uh, and depiction uh, in monstrous and thinking about Micah specifically. Does that answer the question? It does actually, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Um, for this next question, this is um, going back to Cass, I'm gonna actually combine these next two questions. Um, how do you, how would you say we could implement um, frameworks of teaching, um, teaching like uh, racism and confronting it in the classroom? And how do you suggest also avoiding some of the hurdles that come with that, such as, you know, um, parents restricting it, superintendents restricting it, getting approvals such as that, because it does seem like that's a big problem in this day and age where it seems to have to pass so many boards of approval, especially ones that start at home with the parents having to get final permission, and that's usually where the buck stops for many different things. What do you suggest as um, navigating that hurdle and um, also implementing in the classroom to begin with? Yeah, so so I mean, there's there's uh, it's it's basically a virtual minefield, right? When it comes to navigating this, uh, one of my one of my closest colleagues and and mentors, actually, Ozzy Monge, was fired by my university for teaching anti-racist curriculum. So what we're doing is still is still dangerous for our careers, right? And so navigating all of the bureaucracy that comes with the K through twelve side of it, that like I don't even have to deal with at the university, um, is is tricky. So everything's going to come down to really finding ways to fit it into the curriculum, either under the radar, not, not like going again unethically, right? But what I mean is finding ways where it still fits the realm of or the standards of what they're looking for, but it also fits our purposes for anti-racist education, right? And that's how I kind of started because I was a little afraid at first. So really my curriculum is built around and it kind of touches on this other question about um, not, not overwhelming people is I use so much pop culture because that's where we encounter the majority of our our um, you know our others that we navigate in the world right and so so because of that it sort of removes a little bit of attention from the classroom because we're focusing on these creations that aren't actually real whatever and then also I use a lot of just generative questions and reflection so the more we move again towards and this is where the controversy comes in with my curriculum, the more we move, move towards this idea of the voice of color thesis, where we're listening to actual people share stories and narratives, and we learn to prioritize that as actual knowledge, not just like anecdotes or whatever, right? Um, when we give that its due, as, as again, as knowledge, the way it should be viewed, um, we'll be able to, to navigate these more easily without just bringing in like a documentary on racism or having to subject students to watching 1960s uh, riot footage over and over again, right? Because my goal also is to never traumatize my students, especially my BIPOC students who come in and definitely don't need to see any of this. Um, so I never show graphic footage, I never show graphic images, and, and that's where I differ from some anti-racist educators, is there's this belief that you do have to traumatize or you do have to, to bring them into it. And in some ways, yes, but I think that there are other ways to do that. So again, it's gonna, it's gonna really depend on the, the district you're in, the board you've got, everything, but doing this kind of like, you know, underground, on the sly, whatever you want to call it, is I think going to be the best way right now until we get more of this stuff mandated. Thank you so much. That was a beautifully answered question. There's so much to navigate when it comes to the classroom, what I've noticed, and it's like even being out of the classroom for at least the last, um, I want to say eight years, it's been very hard to just understand that there are continually continuing gaps in education as we proceed forward in all ways, shapes, and forms. 
All right, so the next question I have is for Ayani. Um, when looking at the work, artwork for Monstrous, um, that we have to wonder if there's something to be said about the feminine me as both the soft and strong simultaneously, especially when the viciousness of the art has a soft texture to it. What do you consider the juxtaposition between this when you have such a kind of like a violent context, but such a delicate art style? Yeah, um, honestly, I think that's part of the allure of Monstrous is this weird play um, between the fact that the art is in a lot of ways painterly, right? I feel like a lot of these panels I could take and frame on my wall or um, put as part of a gallery. Um, and yet they are so incredibly brutal in so many different ways. Um, I didn't show too many of the explicitly brutal ones here, but there are some where there are moments where limbs are torn asunder um, and things of that nature. So I think that contrast uh, is on purpose uh, and kind of plays into the same kind of thing uh, Lou and Takeda are doing explicitly with the characters, is playing both on your expectations of what is beautiful, what beauty is and how it functions, but also what it means to be delicate, right? Um, and how a lot of times we explicitly think that if something is feminine or if something is womanly, then that thus means it is delicate or an incapable of defending itself. Um, so I think that's all part of the project that Lou and Takeda are uh, engaging in over the course of the comic. Um, and I know in, I've read some critiques of the work that the art seems stiff in a lot of ways because it does rely on this sort of painterly quality. Um, um, but in my personal opinion, I think it's on purpose and it seems lively and vivid to me. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's all part of the, the uh, project of questioning, the project of breaking down boundaries around our pre-assumed assumptions, both of beauty, art, and femininity. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, next question we have for um, Peyton. Uh, do you feel that tattooing and body form modification can be absolutely crucial in a journey of self-discovery and self-acceptance, especially when one, one feels like they lack the voice otherwise? I feel like crucial is a tough word because I do think that like for people who may have experienced like traumas related to needles or traumas, like really easy, even physical traumas, I'm not going to say you need to do this in order to like deal with other things like I'm that I don't think it's that for me it was crucial for me um I had like this fear of like keep like I don't know keeping my skin pristine and pure and whatever and like for me I think disrupting that so to speak is what helped me disrupt this like really unhappy life that I was living um but yeah I think that like tattoos for me helped heal the wounds the internal wounds but for others I think I don't think it could be like a you have to get a tattoo in order to like heal on the inside. I think that everyone has like different forms, um, but yeah. Thank you, that's what, just what I was thinking. It was like, um, I feel like with uh, the media and everything today, there's a lot of pressure to perform like, uh, I don't know, these different changes in, in yourself to stand out or be unique or be um, ideal when it seems to be like a lot of just like we're controlling the image so that we can rob the um, the actual expression of it so that it's like, oh, you're getting this because it, it's what you're told rather than you're getting it because of Yeah, I was also going to say like in re relation to that, I think like in terms of like, I used to have to feel, or I used to feel really like compelled to turn certain parts off of me in certain spaces and like perform femininity. And I feel like my tattoos have like kind of, like not forced me because obviously I could hide them, but they're just like a part of me. And so like, if I go into a room, I'm not gonna be like hiding my whole like right arm, right? So then like, I feel like I'm automatically like, okay, no, I'm bringing all of these parts of me into this room, even though in the past I've been scared to do so. I don't have to talk about it then, like what I was saying with the like the nonverbal signaling, I feel like that um, kind of helps as well. I definitely 100% agree. Um, for the next question, we have this for Cass. Um, we're curious to what your thoughts are on the implementation of CRT in K-12. Your point in curriculum 
uh, produced by the state and largely reading is difficult um, by the state and largely informed by the white um, supremacy as well taken after the multicultural education act however limited from the 70s it was clear that the new curriculum was only being implemented in schools that had the resources to adapt it uh, further widening a gap between socioeconomic classes in terms of access and knowledge and characterizing new curriculum um, as elitist rather than justice oriented the more recent Fair Education Act in California didn't adjust for this. How do we get this info to teachers who are already overloaded? Oh, I love this question. I love this question because it always comes back to indigenous knowledge systems, right? So again, the more we come back to this idea of like, we are inherent sources of legitimate knowledge, right? The more we can start teaching these kids, even kids as young as, as again, like kindergarten, that they already have the skills necessary to start critically engaging with their entire world right so especially the content that they consume so again the more we focus on like um, a, a pop culture multimodal education right the more we bring that into the classroom the more they realize right that they already know how to sort of navigate this they already can tell you why they do or do not like stuff they can tell you why a gumball is funny to them or why it annoys them etc right so then we can start moving on and we can start saying like, okay, well, you know, what do you think, um, how, you know, uh, what do you think the difference between Gumball and Darwin is, right? Because for those of you who don't know, Gumball is largely coded as biracial, but not black. And Darwin is largely coded as a black child, even though he's a fish and, and Gumball's a blue cat, right? And so, so again, the more we move our curriculum away from that elitist academic, um, you know, just, oh, memorize all of these terms and then apply it whatever the more we move away from that and definitely that like multicultural flattening that came out of the multicultural movement of the 80s and the 90s um, the more we can get back to hey again racism sucks white supremacy sucks we're not trying to brainwash you you've already been brainwashed let's just teach you how to like undo all this harm and let's move away from it so so i really again it's always for me is going to come back to bringing out that idea of like what these students want out of education and how they can use their own voices right for this anti-racist curriculum that we want to develop so the curriculum itself again can largely look like whatever it is you want to bring into your classroom right and tacking on to that um, how do you propose your approach moving beyond ethnic studies to decolonization of education as a whole Oh gosh, I mean, just like burn all institutions down. <laughs> no, um, I mean, they pay, they pay me, right? So no, don't do that. Um, but I mean, I, I have to agree with, uh, with J.M. Hunter. I'm sorry, I don't know who you are in here. But I have to agree when you said that, that multiculturalism, right, overtakes everything in education right now. Like every time I, I go to speak about this stuff, people will try to come back at me with multiculturalism. We already have it. It's like, well, multiculturalism, though, again, it just squishes everybody together and it just kind of says that we all have the same experience or we all need to experience things the same way it's that difference between equality and equity right so the the idea that we need to instead pretend that everybody's the same and and whatever it's that colorblind racism essentially um the um the i totally just lost my train of thought here we go yeah, so anyway, I like that. I like that right down there. Um, Lawana, I believe. Yeah, multiculturalism is a failed experiment, right? Multiculturalism is a tool of white supremacy. So unfortunately, undoing that is like a first step. Getting this stuff implemented as mandatory education is a first step. But really, like, we can't even get our universities right now to offer the class I'm teaching, right? So I, I think that starting, starting with at least implementing some type of curriculum change is a good start right is a good start and then just allowing us to kind of build from there is going to be um, going to be I think the best route to reform because again I don't necessarily believe in reform I don't think it can really work but I don't have all the answers and how to fix the system so I just kind of like default to everybody else around me who's way smarter and does have answers so like I think that if we just all come together we all start teaching what we want we move away from this idea again 
understand that like ethnic studies is a thing as opposed to no you just need to go take a black studies class because you need to learn about that specific group not because you need to learn about like how they fit into the broader like multicultural salad or soup or whatever your metaphor is you want to pick right um and so learning also to just I don't know. I, I I just lost my thought on that. But it's it's like we basically have to find a way to get racist educators and policymakers out, right? And and again, I don't have an answer for that. I just know that that is the answer. And again, to tack onto that um, from a different angle, we also have like um, certain things such as like um, standardized testing and like how do you feel about like how that contributes to part of the racist education? Because um, especially when we consider that the standard of education is not equal across the board. We have a lot of um, different schools that definitely receive a lot less attention, a lot less funding, and even ones that tend to be in more well-off areas still have um, shortcomings due to a lot of budget cuts and general defunding of education. How do you feel about how that kind of just like, um, allows this um, systemic racism in education to persevere. All of these elements come from white supremacy. So if we allow any of them to exist in education, we're always going to have white supremacist education. It's just, it's just a fact of it, right? And so unfortunately, it's like, it, again, you know, we have to replace all of these racists, um, as it was said, or, and we might not see it happen in our lifetimes. We have to just keep forcing it right we have to um we have to also move away from this idea that you can't quantify um intelligence or knowledge and so standardized testing right is a tool of white supremacy i mean that definitely is something that, that hopefully everybody in higher education at this point knows because of the bell curve and eugenics etc cetera, etc cetera. um so you're talking to someone who scored in like the 11th percentile of math on the act due to different disabilities and such and i was told multiple times i didn't belong in college and i've heard multiple times that certain students like that who can't perform on a test don't belong in college so again replacing the people who believe that this is a legitimate form of education replacing people who believe that giving students tests nine out of ten days in the classroom or whatever is is valid these are all steps that we all have to start doing right so if you're in education um, it feels like you're alone but really you're not alone you just might be alone maybe in your school but there also might just be people who are afraid so we need to stop being afraid we need to stop caring we need to make the racists afraid right and we need to kind of take the reins again don't know how we're going to do this. I just know it needs to happen. I agree. And um, Ayani and Peyton, how do you feel about um, kind of like the state of our education when it comes to the race, the systemic racism and the absolute restrictions that we have on students? Because it seems like there is just a lot in what we can consume the media and what we can um, display and what we can share amongst each other and, and be taught in schools. Because I feel like that's a lot to unpack. But like in just like a brief statement, how do you two feel about that? Whoever likes to go first. Uh, I can jump in first really quickly. Um, Cass, I've been thinking a lot about what you're saying because I'm a fairly new teacher. I just started teaching for the first time at my PhD program. So like learning about what it means to be in front of a classroom, learning about what it means to have to work with uh, variety of students that are coming from all these different walks of life and different perspectives and then being in front of the classroom as someone who is uh, clearly coded as a person of color um, and on top of that as a woman um, it it's just uh, it's an interesting kind of I don't know dual consciousness perhaps um, in thinking about what it means to kind of on one hand be in charge of this classroom and on the other hand have to deal with the different kinds of stigmas and thought processes that people are coming into the class with. Um, but one thing that you really said that I latched onto is kind of how multimodal teaching can uh, open up different doorways and pathways for our students. Um, one of the classes that I was teaching last year was a multimodal uh, literature class um, and the whole purpose of the class was to get students thinking about how their commentary, how their work can be disseminated in a variety of different ways. Um, and this last semester that I taught it, I had at least three or four students who were thinking about race in media um, and thinking about how different uh, perceptions of 
people and individuals um, across the board can kind of impact how we think about people's lived experiences. Um, so I totally agree that multimodal education is one of the ways to kind of start to break down some of these barriers by asking students to not only think critically about the work that they're seeing, but also the work that they're producing and how their voices kind of influence and change the conversation. And Peyton, quick closing thoughts on yeah. that? Really quick, um, I actually wrote a paper for a different conference about how like Ohio has these language pro progressive skills chart and it's part of like the Ohio K through 12 standards for English uh, language arts handbook. And at the, at like throughout they're trying to like give us the picture or paint a picture of who their ideal student would be. And at the end they literally, this is a quote, say, students can vicariously inhabit worlds and have experiences much, much different than their own as like part of their like, you are a diverse, knowledgeable person now. And I think that that is just such a fucked up, I'm gonna say it, um, way of like understanding like diversity training. And really it's like, it's extended far beyond the educational like system in like in educational si systems and like workplaces too with like the diversity training and all of that. But yeah, I just think that it totally needs to shift from understanding white students putting themselves, thinking that they're living vicariously, thinking that they're having these experiences within the safety of their classroom versus like, I don't know, we need to shift away from teaching to them and creating curriculum and language for curriculum to them. I couldn't agree more. And on that note, it looks like we've uh, reached our end of the end of our time. I'd like to thank everyone who presented and everyone who asked so many wonderful and beautiful questions. Um, uh, I believe we have someone that uh, we have presenters coming up after us, so I'd like to pass the torch to whoever is on. I do apologize for not being so familiar with the schedule. <laughs>